you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buff here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is real estate investment expert, Welcome Wilson. Uh, Welcome is the founder and chairman of the Board of Welcome Group, a privately held real estate development firm that owns 90 manufacturing and industrial facilities in Texas, comprising of over 4 million square feet of space. Wilson is also a principal in Kingham Dalton Wilson Limited, a regional industrial construction company. Now, Mr. Wilson has been a real estate developer in Texas for 57 years, beginning with his first project in Galveston County, which is now the incorporated city of Jamaica Beach. He was also the developer of Tiki Island in Galveston County, now an incorporated city of 1,200 home sites. In total, Mr. Wilson developed 8,000 home sites in four counties in Texas. In addition to planned communities and industrial property, Mr. Wilson was a developer of apartments, retail centers, office buildings, including two 22-story buildings in downtown Houston and a hotel, which was the fifth Marriott ever built, and this was way back in 1965. He's also the author of the new book, Always Welcome, Nine Decades of Great Friends, Great Times, and Mostly Great Deals. In the 1950s and 60s, Mr. Wilson served in the executive office of the president under both presidents Dwight D. Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy. At the age of 30, he received the Arthur Fleming Award as one of 10 outstanding young men in the federal service. And to provide you with some additional context to uh, the incredible honor that this representative of receiving this award, both Neil Armstrong and Robert Gates were later recipients of this same award. Now, guys, I will tell you that this brief biography really falls short in conveying the sheer magnitude of both Mr. Wilson's life experiences and business endeavors. And so I really prefer to have you hear it directly from the source. And so with that, I'm very excited to get onto the show with the welcome. But first, I have a few announcements I would like to share with you guys. Uh, First and foremost, for those that have been listening to the show now for a number of years, you'll know that literally for the past, I guess, four years, not for the past one year, but for the first four years of this show, I used to offer a free 30-minute phone consultation with me where you could set up a call and we could get on the phone together and talk about your real estate business. And you could utilize me as a sounding board and you know, ask any questions that you might have. And uh, I did stop that program about a year ago just due to the sheer bandwidth uh, demands of doing those calls each and every week. Well, I've got great news. I'm actually going to be starting up those calls again. Every Friday, I'm going to make myself available for 30-minute time slots to discuss basically anything your heart desires regarding real estate investing. However, I will say that there is one caveat here. We're going to be conducting these calls via the Zoom video conference platform. And so you're going to need to have a camera available as well as a decent microphone. I'm going to be recording these calls and releasing them as future educational content. And really the best part about this is, is our conversation together is going to have the ability to benefit thousands of others who have similar questions that are probably dealing with the same exact challenges that you are within your business. And you can really think of this as a way of you and I teaming up and giving back to the masses. I think that's pretty cool. Looking forward to having a lot of fun and and meeting each and every one of you out there and and to hopefully help you through different challenges. Now, in order to schedule this call with me, you can visit my website, kevinbupp.com. Scroll down about three quarters of the way on the right-hand side and look for a button that says schedule a call with Kevin. When you schedule that time, be sure to provide clear and concise details on what exactly you'd like to speak about during these 30 minutes together. Again, to schedule that call, go to kevinbup.com, click on the schedule call with Kevin button about three quarters of the way down on the right-hand side of the homepage. Another real quick important announcement is we're hiring here at Sunrise Capital Investors and I tell you that our team is growing at a very rapid rate and we're seeking rock star talent to, to join us here at our corporate offices in Tampa Bay, Florida. Go to careers.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com to see the various positions available here with our group. Now, guys, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest of honor for today's show, Welcome Wilson. Welcome. How are you doing today, my friend? Doing fine, thanks. Kevin. Yes. As I mentioned, I've been looking forward to this show now for, for over a month. I've uh, been very excited to get you on here. Just the extent 
of your experience as a business professional is just astounding. And so uh, you've done a lot over your 57 years in the real estate field. So I'm real excited to kind of dive in there and just hear about some of the the good times and the bad times and, and everything in the middle, really. And so before we really dive into the, the meat and potatoes, welcome. If you could, maybe take a few minutes. And, and for those that are not familiar with you, you know, tell us a little bit more about your background and tell us how you got started 62 years ago. Well, I was going to be in the oil business, which in Houston, Texas, is a big business. So I joined an oil man, R.E. Bob Smith, to learn the oil business. He was an independent. At first, he sent me to City Hall, where I served as an assistant to the mayor. Got a lot of experience, especially making speeches and things like that. Then he called me in one day and he said, you know, the oil business is over for the independents. He said, these wells now cost $30,000, $40,000 to drill. And an independent just can't raise that kind of money. So you ought to go in the real estate business. Well, he was wrong. T. Boone Pickens from Tulsa, Oklahoma, proved that with master limited partnerships and things like that, you can drill all the oil wells you want. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he was the largest landowner in Harris County. And that's where Houston is located. And uh, he had like 30,000 acres, including the very, very key tracts of land for example he owned both sides of the west loop which is five miles from downtown and he owned both sides of the west belt in the same direction west of town which is 15 miles from downtown Mm -hmm. but anyway so bob smith thought i should be a, a a real estate investor well i had had no money to invest so uh, I became a developer, and he helped me on my first project, which was Jamaica Beach in Galveston, now a separate city under Texas law. And uh, I found a piece of land that was available to sell for cash, and he bought it for cash. And then I talked him into selling it to me for a dollar down. <laughs> and whenever I would sell something, I'd give him some small piece of it. Then he agreed to co-sign my note at the bank for $250,000 unsecured. This 62 years ago. Wow. Serious money. So I could put it in the streets and utilities for the subdivision. Mm -hmm. So then I I learned to borrow 100% of my cash needs from banks. And the banks were less regulated in those days, so it was simple. So in no time, I owed fifty million dollars. <laughs> but anyway, the uh, the subtitle of my books is the importance of friends and partners, mm-hmm. and Bob Smith is the perfect example of that because of his faith in me. He was able to get me started in a big way when I knew nothing about real estate development Mm -hmm. and I made many mistakes. For example, I sold a 90 foot lot on the Gulf of Mexico for (laughs) $3,500. Well, I sold out the first week and then I didn't sell any of the back lots forever. So I underpriced the Gulf front property without question. I made other mistakes. For example, when I started digging canals, even though my gut told me that it was wrong, the uh, engineer said, your bulkheads have to be six inches into the ground. Well, that didn't make any sense to me. And uh, so I learned a lesson there because the bulkheads did not last. So then when the, now we build them, I mean, then after that, we built them three feet into the ground. Mm -hmm. but that taught me a lesson and that is never go against your gut instinct. (laughs) If a expert tells you something like an engineer or an architect and in your gut, you know, he's wrong. Go with your gut. 
because you know more, but your gut knows more about it than, than he does. Sure. No, that's great advice. And, uh, you know, I, I've had my fair share of experiences of either agreeing with my gut, but also disagreeing with my gut. And, and ultimately, as you had just laid out there, most of the time when I go against my gut feel, things would take a turn for the worse or going the wrong direction. So that, that's great advice, especially from someone that's been doing this for 62 years. And I'm sure you've had your fair share of gut checks. And, you know, I want to back up real quick, Wilson, because it, you, you, we just covered a whole, uh, whole bunch of uh, great information that I, I want to drill down a little deeper into. And I think one of the, the first things that really caught my attention about your story and getting started was the importance of, of a mentor, the, you know, the individual that helped give you the leg up in the business, that helped you get your start, that, that truly had faith in you and, and believed in you. And so uh, if you could maybe expand a little bit on the the sheer benefit and power behind that relationship, that mentorship, and then also maybe talk about a little bit of how over the years maybe you've maybe paid it forward. I'm sure you've helped other people get into the business, other folks within your, your organization and other friends and associates that you've come in contact with. And so maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Certainly. First of all, my father, when I was 17 years <coughs> old, I was about to be drafted into World War II. Mm -hmm. And Harry Truman, the president, dropped two atom bombs on Japan 30 days before I was to report for duty. And the war ended in August. And I was to report when I was 17 and a half, which would have been September 17th, 1945. Mm -hmm. I had a life-changing conversation with my father. He said that to succeed in business, you have to have guts and determination. Guts and determination. Mm -hmm. And when he said guts, he didn't mean the guts to get into a fight. He meant the guts to make a pitch, to make a pitch to somebody important that's highly in your favor and be able to keep a straight face and look them in the eye and uh, be sincere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my friendship with Ari Bob Smith was a, was a result of me making a pitch to him and in the early days, and it was very important. I spent my first 12 years after graduating from college in government service. At first, I worked for the University of Houston for nine months until I was called into the Korean War five years after, four years after the World War II ended. And I went in as, as an enlisted man and then was commissioned as an officer and served two years in J Japan as a naval officer. Mm -hmm. Then Bob Smith sent me to City Hall and I worked for the city of Houston for three years. Learned a great deal as an assistant to the mayor and uh, so forth. I was on Bob Smith's payroll, but I really was a city official. Mm -hmm. Then Eisenhower appointed me as five-state director of an agency that was very important at the time, the Office of Defense Mobilization, five states, Texas, and the four surrounding states. And uh, one small branch of my headquarters was what is now known as FEMA. Hmm. We call hmm. it the Natural Disaster Office. We had millions and millions of dollars to pass out to cities and governments and so forth. And uh, so that gave me an opportunity to uh, know every congressman from my five states, or 30 of them, uh, the 10 senators from my five states, and of course, the governors of the five states. So having a big sack of money to pass out was a fortunate thing for me. And when I received the appointment, by the time I was 30, I had the civil service rank of a three-star general. Wow. 30 years old. It was an incredible opportunity for me to get experience and to make connections and so forth. Then I had a life-changing conversation with my wife. She said, uh, being the five-state director, Every time I would fly to New Orleans to make a speech, 
my picture would be on the front page of the Times Picayune Daily Newspaper. The same with uh, Oklahoma City and Little Rock, Arkansas, and Dallas, Texas, and so forth. And I, like I say, the income was good. I had the rank of a three-star general. When I flew into an Air Force base, nothing less than a full colonel could meet my plane by regulation. So I went to my wife and I said, honey, you know, we're living the good life here. And maybe I was think of just making a career of the Navy, of the civil service. Mm-hmm. And she said, look, I didn't marry you to be the wife of a federal employee. She said, I want my children to go to private schools. I want to be a socialite in Houston, Texas. I want to live on River Oaks Boulevard. That's the premier street in Houston for rich people. And she says, none of that's going to happen if I'm the wife of a federal employee. (laughs) <laughs> so I saw that my time was running out. <laughs> and so I resigned my position and became a real estate developer in, in Houston and Galveston. Okay. Well, when you talk about motivation, it sounds like that was the, you know, the, the highest form of inspiration and motivation that one could actually experience you know, from their significant other. So, and, and kudos to your wife for, I guess, probably lighting a little bit of a fire underneath your butt. <laughs> so, No doubt. Yeah. Way, this year we will have been married 70 years. Wow. Congratulations. That's amazing. Congratulations. I've never heard of anybody b- being married 70 years. So, but there's got to be some. I'm 91 years old. Oh, well, you, you look fantastic. And yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. And congrats on such a long way. I've, I've got nine years under my belt, so I've got many more years to go. But uh, I hope to be to year 70 and still be you know, here to talk about it. So th- that's a wonderful thing. So I'd love to, let's talk about your influence on the, the city of Houston, because that sounds like what, where you just brought us up to in your story is really the, the pinnacle point. You know, that was the pivotal moment to where you went from government employee to, you know, a private sector real estate developer. And ultimately, you know, you became some of a living legend in the city of Houston. So I'd love to hear about that. And, you know, you really helped bring the city of Houston up to what it's known as today. I mean, you you built a lot of projects in the area. You played a major role in the building of the Astrodome. So maybe if you could maybe share some of those stories with us and and what that time looked like once you stepped into the, the world of a private developer. Kevin, the uh, grass is always greener on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was developing resort subdivisions, I decided that it, it wasn't dignified enough, so I needed to become an, an apartment developer. And I'll swear, every apartment project I would start, I would start it in a boom and open in a bust. <laughs> and, but again, I, I learned a lot about, uh, for example, when I per- formed the first partnership for an apartment project, I had eight equal partners, eight equal partners. Well, the contractor went busted, and I did not have a bond. So every Friday, I was down there writing checks to pay the subcontractors. Well, because nobody owned more than 12.5%, nobody else was willing to step in and play a meaningful role. Mm. So uh, I learned from that, and I bought out three of the partners and, uh, and went back to the, my Jamaica Beach partners, which included Jack Valenti, who, by the way, was later president of the Motion Picture Association of America for 40 years. Wow. (laughs) He was an advertising executive in Houston and my partner, a great guy. He's a guy, godfather to my son, Craig. Mm -hmm. And then another partner I had was Johnny Goen, who was later mayor pro tem of Houston for 22 years. The third partner was my brother, Jack. And my fourth partner was Bill Sherrill, Bill Sherrill was later a uh, member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington, D.C. Wow. 
and CEO of a major insurance company and other things. But anyway, it was a talented group, and I was glad to be their partner. Talk to me about some of the things you've learned going through those different boom and bust cycles. You, you made the comment, and I'm sure it's not all you know, 100% true that you know, most of the apartment projects you started were during a boom, and they were ready to, for the lease-up phase during a bust, which is the wrong, the wrong timing. I'm assuming that that didn't happen each and every time. But in the times that it truly did, you know, where it posed a challenge, Talk to me about overcoming that type of challenge, which is a, it's a major form of financial stress, personal stress, business stress. You know, there's a lot of moving parts there at that point in time when, when a project starts going sideways. And so maybe speak to me about some of the ways that you work through those difficulties uh, over the years. Well, I have a item, a, a list of 50 items, and I call them welcomes rules of order. And there's an annex, they are an annex in my book. It's how to succeed in business and life by avoiding my mistakes. And number six is don't let success go to your head. Mm -hmm. The point is in a good economy, everything works. Everything works. And you're not invincible. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the economy turns, practically nothing works. (laughs) <laughs> and you've got to be, so you, you can't assume that everything is going to work out. I mean, you have to prepare for the worst because it's coming in mm-hmm. a bad economy without, without question, particularly if you've been in business as long as I have. I've been through many, many recessions, including the Great Recession. But by the time the Great Recession came along in 2009, I had enough experience to know what I was doing. And so by that time, I, all my b- buildings had 10-year leases on them. Mm-hmm. So uh, I didn't lose a single tenant. Well, that's great. Would you say that that was one of the most challenging recessions that you had gone through during your years as a, uh, a real estate developer? No, no. The, uh, a mild recession of 1973 was the worst that recession 1973, how did that differ? And ultimately, what made it a more challenging time to get through as a uh, real estate investor? Well, it affected me more directly because the banks froze up. In other words, the banks would not lend me any money. And I was depending on 100% loans to uh, continue to do business. So I uh, started to go public. And then I uh, Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States. And a few months after he took office, because of what he said, the Dow Jones industrial average dropped 40% in five weeks. Wow. 40% drop in the Dow Jones in five weeks. So my public stock issue was canceled, but it was, it was tough getting by. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here with Sunrise Capital Investors. As you are hopefully already well aware if you've been a listener for any period of time, my goal has always been to provide you with as much value as I possibly can through my two podcasts, Real Estate Investing for Cashflow and the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. As our audience continues to grow, literally, we've been downloaded millions of times by folks in over 125 countries. I've had thousands of people reach out looking to get involved in our niche. And that's the phenomenal niche of mobile home park investing. For those that don't know, I've been a full-time real estate investor for nearly 20 years now, and I've personally invested in and have owned apartment complexes, various commercial properties, hundreds of single-family rentals, and I've interviewed some of the most successful investors in just about every other asset class, and I've arrived at this one very simple conclusion. Mobile home parks are hands down the best investment I've found to date. Why? They provide investors with the best risk-adjusted returns out of any other real estate sector that I've seen. Investing in real estate can get complicated, and I really want to simplify this process for you. If you're someone who wants to diversify away from the uncertainty of Wall Street and allocate a percentage of, of your real estate portfolio to mobile home parks, but maybe you don't have the time nor the inclination to personally locate good deals yourself, then our team will do it for you. 
At Sunrise Capital Investors, our team specializes in the acquisitions and management of undervalued and highly profitable mobile home parks. And we are now providing accredited investors with an opportunity to participate directly alongside our team in our up-and-coming deals. And let me say this, I believe that we are hands down the best in our space at sourcing highly profitable off-market deals. That's really what makes us unique in this niche and as investment managers. As stewards of your capital, we truly are aligned with our investors. We've structured our investment fund so that we as a company are incentivized in the same way the investor is which is through the performance of the investment itself. In addition, we want to make sure that we not only make money for our investors, but that they understand how it's being made. That's why we provide our accredited partners with a private monthly podcast that walks them through the detailed updates on how their investment is performing. And we're very transparent, providing you with the good, the bad, and the ugly at times. And so if you'd like to learn more about the partnership opportunities with our team here at Sunrise, please go visit sunrisecapitalinvestors.com and click on the investors link to get signed up. It's absolutely free and you'll get placed on the priority list of when new opportunities come along. Also, feel free to call us at 833 Cash Flow Without the O. Again, that's 833 Cash Flow Without the O. And one of our investor relations team members will help you schedule an appointment to speak with one of our managing principals. If you have questions, go ahead and schedule a call and let's get on the phone and talk. And with that, guys, I like to leave with one last thought. From the time that I wake up in the morning to the time that I lay my head down the rest of the evening, my number one priority with everything I do, whether it be recording this podcast, working for our investors, helping each of you reach your investment goals, to providing a great experience to each of our residents who reside in our communities, is to add huge amounts of value to everyone that I come in contact with. Now, with that being said, I look forward to the opportunity of bringing value to you through Sunrise and through this podcast. Thank you for your time. Now, let's go ahead and get back to the show. Wow. I'd love to talk to you about, and I want to be respectful of your time here and make sure that we don't run out of time uh, before we cover a few of the things that I'd like to get out here. And, and one is about the Astrodome. I'd love to hear your involvement in the Astrodome, and, you know, what role you played and ultimately how you came to be one of the chosen ones. <laughs> well, again, it had to do with Ari Bob Smith. Okay. Judge Roy Hoffines had been mayor of Houston when I served as an assistant to the mayor. So uh, with me as head of his campaign, <laughs> we got thrown out of office by a vote of two and a half to one. So Hoffines was looking for something to do. So a group who wanted to bring Major League Baseball to Houston called on Ari Bob Smith, and he sent him to Hoffines. Hoffines liked the idea. So Bob Smith was chairman of the board of the Astros and Hoffines was president. The Astros name, by the way, was a second name. The first name was the Colt 45s. <laughs> the name of the baseball team was the Colt 45s. Hoffines, believe it or not, did not talk to the Colt 45 company about using their name for a baseball team. <laughs> You're talking about, you're referring to the beer company, correct? No. The, or the gun. The Colt Manufacturing Company, which makes the guns. The guns, yeah. <laughs> so they sued the Astros, the baseball team, for using their, using their name without permission. So uh, Bob Smith and Hoffines knew they had to change the name. So Hoffines wanted to call it the Houston Stars, and Bob Smith rejected that name totally. Hoffines wanted to name them the Stars because of the manned spacecraft center that had just been built in Houston. Mm -hmm. And Bob Smith thought it was braggadocious, so Hoffines came up with the name the Houston Astros, and Bob Smith approved it. Interesting so story. Okay. And so did you actually become, were you the, the main general contractor or construction firm that, that managed that project? No, no, no. Not okay. At all. Okay. But I was close to Bob Smith and Hoffines. So I was involved in everything. For example, a survey taken when the Astrodome was under construction, 53% of people in Houston were of the opinion that the roof would cave in when they opened the Astrodome. I was there 
when we remove the superstructure from underneath the, the dome in the stadium, and we moved it to the superstructure down one foot, and the roof came with it, two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet. The roof is still coming down. The roof came down 11 feet before it stopped. No problems with, with, with the roof going forward from that day. Uh, it's been solid as can be, and it's still solid. By the way, uh, Hoffines, who was a brilliant guy, he knew that people would pay more for a seat if they were to walk in and walk down. If they walked up, they expected to be cheap, the seats to be uh-huh. cheap. So instead of just building the Astrodome like a regular stadium, he dug a huge hole underneath the Astrodome. So more than half of the people in the Astrodome would be coming in and walking down to their seats. That's brilliant. It is. And I was there the day we opened the Astrodome. LBJ was president and he flew in from the LBJ ranch for the opening. We played the New York Yankees and beat them, beat them. Can't imagine why, but (laughs) Mickey Mantle was playing for them at the time and hit a home run, but we still beat them. They may have just caved in just to to help us. (laughs) They weren't even in our league. But yeah. then later on, Hoffines bought out Bob Smith, and Bob Smith sold his 10% ownership, the remaining 10% ownership to me. And mm-hmm. I owned it two or three years. Okay, okay. Very, very interesting story. I'm sure we, we could probably spend hours upon hours together of, of all the very stories that you, that you have. And so, but again, I want to be respectful of your time, Mr. Wilson. And, but I, I'd like to ask you, to shift gears slightly and ask you, you know, I guess maybe a little bit more uh, personal question. You know, you've grown a very successful real estate development company over the years. You've, your team is probably top notch. I mean, it, the folks that you've attracted and retained over the years that have ultimately allowed you to expedite your growth and, and overall success. And so my question would be, what key attributes do you feel separates a highly successful developer and investor like yourself to someone that maybe hasn't found that same success yet or maybe hasn't gained the same notoriety as you have over the years. Any thoughts on that? Guts and determination. Just what your father told you, right? (laughs) You have to have the the guts to go make a pitch to a banker, to an investor, to a, we now build, develop industrial buildings and the 4 million square feet you made reference to is all industrial buildings in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some of the biggest, tenants known to man in our industri- industrial. But the point is, single tenant industrial buildings, we've never been less than 96% occupied. Most of the time, we've been 98% occupied. Mm-hmm. And that makes a huge difference. See, when you open a hotel, for example, your leases are one day. hmm you lease your real estate for one day in a hotel. With an apartment project, you lease it for six months. And then you, when you open, you know you have a handful of occupants and that's all. But in a single tenant industrial buildings, you have 10-year, 12-year, 15-year leases. And that makes a huge difference. Now, it takes a lot more capital For example, we are now building a $25 million building for a German company called Mann Diesel. They've been Mm -hmm. in business since 1773. Mm -hmm. It it takes a lot of capital, but we know how to raise capital. And it takes a lot of big loan. And we're experts at borrowing money. So it's not a strain on us. Just recently, a company that used to be called Rothschilds in New York, made a deal with us to invest $300 million in new buildings. Wow. And that $300 million with debt will take us well beyond a billion dollars in real estate. Hmm. And uh, in America, you have to have a billion dollars worth of real estate to get respect. (laughs) 
Well, it sounds like you've been there for quite some time. <laughs> so that's quite interesting. You know, the question about the industrial, you know, your take on the, you know, it being a less risky endeavor when you compare it to the, you know, short-term leases associated with a hotel being one night or a, an apartment being six or 12 months, even some retail being, you know, three or five years, office being three or five years, sometimes longer than that. You know, would you not also say on the flip side of that, that there, there could be some potential additional risk associated with an industrial investment that might not be associated with one of those residential type of uh, shorter term investments, such as, you know, a single tenant gets up and leaves, you got an entire building empty, whereas a single tenant leaves in a 100 unit apartment complex, you've got still 99% occupancy. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you've got to select the right tenants. They've got to have good credit and they have to understand the rules. And we, for example, I used to have 100 employees back when I was developing subdivisions and apartments and things like that, of 100 employees. Now I have 16 employees. And the reason is single tenant industrial buildings. We don't change the light bulbs. We don't (laughs) sweep the floors. We don't mow the grass. Single tenant industrial buildings, all we do is we have triple net leases. Mm -hmm. We handle the Three things. We handle the on taxes, the insurance, and the foundation of the buildings. Mm-hmm. And that's all. Got it. And so in our property management department, we have one employee. Wow. Because all we're doing is collecting checks. Very interesting. Now, that I, I like that business model. It sounds like a very, you know, yeah, the, very easy to manage and low maintenance. The, the, the difference is... It takes a lot of capital. Yeah. And so in, in the, I couldn't have gone into this business in the beginning because I had no capital. Mm-hmm. Of but all that. Uh, but, but now that I, I can get in all the capital I want. And by the way, I'm, I'm no longer the chief executive officer of the company. Welcome Wilson Jr. is the chief CEO. Okay. He's 68 years old. Got it. Okay. You know, of, of all the different assets that you've owned, it sounds like industrial is probably single tenant, triple net industrial is probably your favorite. What would be the least favorite? I mean, you, you, it sounds like you've had your fingers in a little bit of everything. You've done single family subdivisions, you've done office, you've done retail, you've done multifamily apartments. What would you say is your least favorite of everything you've done thus far? I would say it was it'd be retail. Okay. Because the, the leases are typically three years. And the tenants always leave when you, you least expect them to. But apartments, you see, the thing about it is, in Houston, Texas, we go through years of being overbuilt in apartments. So if you're overbuilt, if the city is overbuilt, you can't get the rent you need. Mm-hmm. And you can't get, you get the occupancy you need. By the way, when I was in the apartment business, we had what we call the Army of Occupation. And what that was, was a bunch of airline stewardesses, principally, that would move into your project so that you could meet the occupancy requirement for the first lien loan. And uh, of course, you'd have to give them a break on the rent. But the the Army of Occupation was... uh, a bunch of good-looking airline hostesses <laughs> move into your projects and make you so you could close the first lien loan. Interesting. I've never heard of that. This is the first. I'd like to ask you the question, uh, Welcome. If you could go back in the year one, if you go back 62 years when you first got your start, knowing what you know today, knowing of all the different experiences you've had along the way, if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice, what would that advice be? Well... <laughs> One thing, don't take yourself so seriously because no one else does. (laughs) Understand that uh, don't let success go to your head Mm -hmm. because you can be a a big success and then uh, in no time the economy is turned on you and you're bailing water. One rule that I always have is if you have five important things to do today, Start with the most difficult one first. Mm-hmm. Do the most difficult one first. 
Yeah, it's, it seems like most people take the opposite approach to that last rule you just mentioned there, and they 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 typically feel they feel accomplished if they get something done, and so they always pick the lowest hanging fruit of the tasks that are on their plate for the day. And uh, but I agree with you. You know, pick the biggest one, chomp, even if you don't get all five done, then because the big one was you know took a lot of time, get those big ones out of the way because it seems like the big ones are going to be the ones that help you progress in in your personal life and in your business. The small ones typically don't move the needle. You know, they're not the ones that are pushing you forward and helping you grow. It's always those big ones that most people like to maybe avoid or brush underneath the rug or push off for another day. Would you agree with that? I agree. Yeah. Entirely. Yeah. Well, welcome. This this has been absolutely phenomenal time. I really appreciate you coming to the show. And I and I had just one last question I want to ask you. And it's really based on the the premise of your book. It sounds like you're you're very much a family man. You've been married for 70 years. You've got your children involved in your business, which I think is absolutely wonderful. Can't wait to to my my boys are old enough and I hope that they find interest in what it is I do and and would like to be a part of it and and, and create a lot of longevity out of what we've uh, built today. And so, you know, very admirable. But just from your perspective, talk to me about the really from your words, the importance of friends and family. Let's take business aside and let's talk about you know, the value of friends and family and how important that is and how that ties into growing a successful business. Well, for example, without Ari Bob Smith, I wouldn't have gotten started at all. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't my partner. He was just my friend. But I would say that, that having the right partners and the right friends are everything in business. Mm-hmm. And you need to give you give your credit your partner's credit. And by the way, don't ever issue an ultimatum, especially to your spouse. Ultimatums do not work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely great advice. And again, absolute pleasure having you here. Welcome, and I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, again, cr- congratulations on seventy successful years of marriage. That's very impressive. You've got a you know, your, your wife is lucky and you're very lucky to have her. And it sounds like you guys have had a lot of fun together over the years. We have indeed. In fact, my wife and I and our descendants with spouses, <laughs> 50 people and wow. 30 came over for my birthday last Sunday. I was turned 91 years old, but we have a big family. That's fun. We, yeah. we have 16 Great grandkids. Wow. 15 grandkids and five kids. That's quite impressive. And is that all in the Houston area? Some of them, uh, for example, I have a granddaughter who is a vice president of uh, Warner Brothers. Wow. Okay. I have a uh, granddaughter who is a, uh, an assistant to Senator Ted Cruz from Texas mm-hmm. in Washington, D.C. No, they're everywhere. Let me tell you another life-changing conversation I had with my wife. Please. I had met her, and I thought she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my life. And then I didn't see her on the campus at the University of Houston for six months. And then finally I bumped into her someplace in the hallway at the University of Houston, and I never let her go again. <laughs> so after we dated, she had seven dates a week with different people. I, I was happy to have two of those dates because that's all I could afford. So uh, after we'd been going together about nine months, we were sitting in a pig stand across the street from Sears Roebuck in Houston. In a drive, it's a drive-in restaurant. And we were sitting in the car having lunch, having a sandwich, a pig sandwich. And uh, she said, so-and-so, who was a rich kid from River Oaks in Houston, rich, handsome, tall, I hated him. (laughs) She said he had asked her to marry him for the fifth time. And before she gave him an answer, she wanted to me to weigh in on it. And so I said, of course, you're going to say no. And and you and I are going to get married as soon as I'm 26 years old. My father always said a man doesn't have enough sense to get married before he's 26. (laughs) So uh, I was 20 at the time. So she said something to the effect of good luck with that plan. 
And I realized that my time was running out. So I asked her to marry me the next month. And we were married nine months later. Oh, that's great. What a great story. I'd love to have uh, heard your father's feedback on that, being that that was not part of the plan that he taught you. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, just a uh, life-changing conversation I had with my father, in addition to the guts and determination, was when he dropped us off at the University of Houston. I was a junior, having graduated from Brownsville Junior College, and my brother was a sophomore. He was older than me, but he had been in World War II. So my father said, boys, I paid your first semester's tuition, and here's $50 each. Now, whenever you boys need anything at all, just call me up on the phone. Call me up on the phone when you need anything, and I'll explain how you can get by without it. (laughs) And we never heard from him financially again the rest of our lives. And the reason is he believed in self-reliance. Yeah. He had the money, but he believed that the best thing he could teach his boys was self-reliance. So we both got jobs, and uh, I was selling advertising for the newspaper, the student newspaper, and we uh, we sang in nightclubs. In the early days of television, we used to do singing commercials before they had recordings. Wow. But anyway, he, he believed in self-reliance and he taught it to us in spades. Well, that, that's so important. I'm glad you're sharing that message because I feel like that's one of those lost messages that, that isn't spoken enough nowadays. So I think that's a, that's a wonderful piece of advice your father gave you. And it sounded like it, it, it surely did you and your siblings well throughout the years. So, well, uh, welcome. This has been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And I, I just want to make sure that we share your, your website for those that are listening that, that would like to learn more about you and your company. And uh, they can do some of their own research and, and see some of the you know, impressive projects that you've been involved in over the years and the, just the dramatic impact that you've had on the, the city of Houston alone. You guys can go to welcomegroup.com. Again, that's welcome, W-E-L-C-O-M-E group.com. And Welcome. That's all we have today, my friend. Again, I really appreciate you coming here. I was very much looking forward to this time together with you and it's exceeded my expectations and I've had a lot of fun with it. So I hope you feel the same way. I do, Kevin. It's been a great pitch. (laughs) All right. Sounds good. Welcome. Well, you have an absolute wonderful day and we'll talk again soon. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. You take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.